Hello everyone, glad to see us on your channel. Today we will listen to the fifth part of the memoirs of German Kohl. Steidel Lewitt Pold, Regimental Commander of Paulus's Sixth Army. My journey with Anna Porker and Prof. Arnold ended in Krasnogorsk in prisoner of war camp No. 17. Here I had to observe for the first time the process of demarcation that began among the Stalingrad officers soon after the surrender on one side were those who had learned nothing and forgotten everything, where the verdicts of secret trials, comrade courts, and slander were in force on the other side, the few officers who resolutely joined the anti-fascist movement, as well as those numerous officers to whom I belonged who, with difficulty, freed themselves from the net of traditional patterns of thought, hardened behavioural habits here. In Krasnogorsk, the first disappointments befell me, when some comrades turned away from me, when it became necessary to know thoroughly the person with whom one was talking. What awaits me here now, at the end of June 1943? By this time, convinced anti-fascists, political emigres such as Wilhelm Pieck, Walter Ulbricht, Eric Weinert, Johannes R. Becker, but also prisoners of war, and among them officers Dr. Hademan and Bernd von Kugelgeln, were here as well as in other camps. They called for the unity of all who wanted to save Germany from the threatened greatest catastrophe the proclamation they published on July 1st was discussed in all camps and within two weeks led to the formation of the National Committee for a Free Germany. Although it was quite clear to me that the assessment of the political and military situation contained in the proclamation was true, although I was impressed by some of its thoughts and conclusions, I still did not agree to join the Constituent Committee moreover, there were fierce disputes between me and the members of the anti-fascist activists, even on the eve of the founding of the National Committee, when delegations from other camps were arriving daily. I remember one meeting at which the position I took provoked a noisy protest. It was about the fascist massacres in Krasnodar. In spite of the fact that I knew a lot of things at that time and had observed them myself, it seemed incredible to me that such inhuman crimes had been committed people were poisoned with gases in specially equipped trucks. This I refused to believe. The observations I later made in the areas liberated from fascism, the impressions I received at Majanek, convinced me that where fascism ruled, crimes seemingly most impossible, most unbelievable, were committed. Some of the anti-fascists with whom I had sharp clashes at that time I met later on the front as an authorised member of the National Committee, and we cooperated in the pursuit of the same goal. Subsequently, Hans Gossens and I were bound together by the most cordial friendship. Already in Krasnogorsk, I soon realised that it was not my refusal to join the National Committee, but the arguments I used to justify my position that had caused a storm of protest. The disagreements reflected a process of fermenting minds. We agreed to many political demands more readily when, as a result of the clash of opinions, we realised what errors and omissions we ourselves had made in our life's journey, what small and large negative phenomena we were prepared to tolerate. Some of the demands made upon us exceeded our capabilities we were not yet able to assimilate and support all the considerations and arguments expressed. Then we objected strongly, entered into disputes, even risking isolation among our like-minded friends. At that time, my meeting with Gunther van Hooven helped me a great deal of friendship developed between us that did not weaken until his death in 1965. Hooven flew to the Stalingrad cauldron by Christmas 1942 as the new Chief of Army Communications and, unlike other officers in his reports to Colonel General Paulus, gave a realistic assessment of the situation. When he arrived in the Sixth Army, he no longer had any illusions about the possibility of unblocking. His observations in the Führer's headquarters and in Army Group Don no longer allowed him to pass off wishful thinking as reality. All this he told unvarnished to Generals Paulus and Schmidt and persistently argued that it was necessary to immediately undertake a breakthrough from the encirclement to save at least part of the encircled army. Hooven and I were almost the same age. Both of us had returned to active military service after having practised our civilian professions for 15 years at the end of the First World War. 
But Van Hooven was much more critical than I was of developments in Germany moreover, because of his civilian specialty, he, working for the central board of the East Prussian Travel Bureau, had an excellent knowledge of Eastern Europe, and above all of much that concerned our immediate Eastern neighbour, the Soviet Union. Apparently he was always interested in historical and political problems. He was also burdened by doubts, and this provided food for endless conversations between us. With Gunther van Hooven, I discussed the problem of the oath of office on several occasions. This problem raised difficult questions for each of us, even though we all differed in origin, upbringing, education, outlook and profession. Those of us who belonged to the older generation had already sworn allegiance three times to the Kaiser and the Kings, to the Weimar Republic, and then to Adolf Hitler. In the Third Empire, the military oath obliged to follow the orders of the so-called Führer unconditionally, without any restrictions, as was explicitly stated in the decree of July 12, 1935. The oath was a tool used in a variety of cases to bind the person who took the oath firmly to the representative of the apparatus of power, to the state. The Nazi Reich thus shackled millions of people who were convinced that they were bound by a genuine oath and therefore pledged their loyalty to the Reich often against their will. During the discussions among the POWs, a wide variety of views on the matter came to light. The oath was interpreted as an obligation to the state and thus to the people, or as an obligation to the Nazi rulers, or as an oath made to a god. An oath is only an obligation, the violation of which is contrary to the dictates of conscience, if the actions to which it obliges serve the common good, benefit the people, and are consistent with the good will of the people. If, however, the military oath obliges individuals or the whole nation to participate in criminal actions or in the realisation of criminal plans, then the circumstance imposed by the oath loses all force, because it is devoid of moral basis, and the dictates of conscience and personal responsibility of man are higher than such an oath. I came to this conviction in the fatal cauldron at Stalingrad. There I also realised that indignation and inner denial do not change anything only a person's deeds matter. However, it was difficult for many deeply religious prisoners of war, even if they realised the criminality of the Nazi regime, to consider themselves free from the oath. None of us knew yet that precept 1318 of the Church Statutes explicitly states, acts connected with the oath that directly bring harm to one's neighbours, to the common good, and to the salvation of the soul lose their binding force. If we knew this precept from how many doubts, from what hesitations connected with guilt, from how many sacrifices we would be spared. And meanwhile, left to ourselves, we have suffered severe torments of conscience, trying to answer for ourselves the question to what does the oath bind us. The formation of the National Committee for a Free Germany. One can see in advance that a major event is approaching. Such was the case at the beginning of July in Krasnogorsk. The camp gates were repainted, the gardens and sidewalk in many places renewed, the doors and windows cleaned. Almost every day new faces appeared in the camp streets the working commissions of the anti-fascist committee met until late at night. Then a group of German communists arrived from Moscow with new information about the participation of delegations from other camps in the founding conference of the National Committee for a Free Germany. During these days I developed closer contact with Willy Bredel, and especially with Eric Weinert. They too were aware that I had not rid myself of some doubts, and had declined the offer to take part in the last preparations for the establishment of the National Committee. I stated that this would have been a rash decision. I was indignant at some of the harsh words, too hasty, generalised remarks about generals and superior officers which I had heard from the members of the Initiative Committee. I was of the opinion that all this created obstacles to the realisation of the kind of joint broad cooperation to which the proclamation of July 1st called us. I also felt that there was opposition to my participation. This is not surprising. After all, among the officers of the general staff who had come into contact with the initiative committee, I was the only one who had been awarded the Knight's Cross. 
Apparently, some of them also remembered that I had refused to sign the resolution of protest against the crimes committed in Krasnodar. I was therefore surprised that on the eve of July 12th, I and some other officers, including Lieutenant Colonel Brett, were invited to attend the founding conference of the National Committee. We who were present as guests were the few officers still wearing the insignia, quite a few of the assembly probably thought it an inappropriate prank, mere bravado. But they were all disciplined. Eric Weinert spoke in his usual manner with restrained passion. He was inexhaustible in his formulations, which invariably resonated with everyone present. In these hours, Weinert undoubtedly felt that he was not only addressing those in the room. He was addressing his people, ours, his homeland, for which he had fought for decades and on whose behalf he spoke. It seemed that each of us became for him a living embodiment of his village, his town, his factory, his organisation, his profession. The People's Tribune, revolutionary, made a convincing, heartfelt speech, which everyone could understand, comprehend its meaning, remember, because it awakened in everyone the feelings born of the thought of the motherland. Weinert aptly characterised the criminal system of fascism, spiritual degeneration, called to save our homeland from its impending doom. He did not speak only of an alliance with the working class. He called for participation in such an international that unites all, atheists and Christians, communists and honest bourgeois democrats, all those who considered it their patriotic duty to fight against Nazism. This gave an exciting meaning to his much-repeated demand for the creation of a strong democratic government in a reasonable form, he outlined the first means and ways that would enable us prisoners of war to realise our noble aspiration to end fascism. Using historical analogies, he convincingly proved to the audience, including the officers invited as guests, that the National Committee Free Germany could consider itself the continuator of the best traditions of German history in the hour of great danger, Weinert said. Patriotic, humanistic forces have always been ready to act independently, on their own responsibility, and their righteousness has been recognised by history. With fervour and passion he stigmatised the blatant crimes, atrocities and abuses of law and law, in which the Nazis and their behind-the-scenes instigators, cowardly accomplices and traitors to the people, who disgraced the honourable name of Germans, were guilty. He demanded retribution and a fair trial for all that had been done, not only in Germany but in all countries to which fascism had brought death and disaster he urged and implored us to get off the wrong path, to come to our senses, to renounce the past and to make a reasonable decision. He appealed to good Germans to finally take the path of humanity and to deprive Hitler, the destroyer of mankind, of the slightest chance of success. Eric Weinert then expressed his gratitude to his comrades Wilhelm Pieck and Walter Ulbricht, Soviet friends who had made it possible to establish the National Committee, who had made it possible not only for communists and emigrants, but also for prisoners of war to join the liberation struggle against fascism together with all peace-loving peoples. All the time until the manifesto was put to the vote, the exchange of opinions continued the conference participants made short or extensive speeches. All of these speeches contained a fervent appeal to the Germans. All of these speeches reflected the exhilaration and the universal conviction of our righteousness which marked this great hour. If anyone else had the slightest doubts about the sincerity of our aspirations, about the rightness of the path we had set out on, here among the deeply moved Germans gathered, Everyone found faith in a new and better Germany here, far from the motherland. The, sp the sprouts of a new Germany were already visible. A new Germany was being born, thanks to the willingness and determination of anti-fascist Germans to devote their whole lives to this great task. Almost all the speakers spoke freely, each in his own way, sticking more or less to the usual phraseology one spoke in exactly the same style in which he addressed students or schoolchildren in his homeland from the pulpit. Another used the same turns of phrase that he used in his close circle when he vented his frustration at the Nazi system. Rarely did anyone use pre-prepared notes. There were revolutionary speeches, both on the first and second day, when the focus was on the content of the manifesto. Meeting with German communists, 
During the first break, on July 12th, we guests were a bit confused and so not only kept together, but also stayed away from the familiar members of the Presidium. However, Eric Weinert, Willie Bredel, Friedrich Wolf welcomed us warmly and suggested that we meet for a talk in a small room in the same building in which the founding conference had taken place. After the lunch break, Wilhelm Pick entered into conversation with us. A crowd of soldiers surrounded us and listened with intense interest. Already in Susdal, I noticed that Wilhelm Pick approached people without prejudice and bias. He knew how to listen, and it was obvious from his answers that he was listening to the words of his interlocutor and trying to find convincing arguments for him. But until now, I had never seen Wilhelm Pick in such a good, joyful mood. He must have been deeply moved by the fact that people from all walks of life had shown their willingness to act and had united to fight against Hitler's fascism. To my surprise, Walter Olbricht also took part in this morning's conversation. I had already seen him in Susdal, but at large meetings, rallies. Now we were sitting together in a narrow circle. During this first meeting, when the convinced communist, intelligent, educated and far-seeing man who appeared before me presented his arguments, I was amazed at the skill with which he outlined the historical development of Germany. I realised that it was necessary to look at other people differently than before. A man's abilities and knowledge only become valuable when he tries to penetrate into the thoughts of another to understand what is going on in his soul, even if he has to answer harshly and ask cruel questions. It took me almost 40 years to realise that we will understand the meaning of history only when we consider our own formation in an inseparable connection with everything that is going on in the world around us. At the founding conference of the National Committee for a Free Germany, Walter Ulbricht spent two days with us, looking closely at those around him, and when he spoke he confined himself to brief business-like remarks. It was evident from everything that this leader of the labour movement knew the true value of people's intentions and emotional reactions, and that he was ready to discuss even problems which, in his and his friend's view, were perhaps only a modest beginning of a solution to the problem. But he took every word and opinion, even the unspoken ones, very seriously, and thus won people over. When Walter Albrecht came to us and drew us into conversation, it was, of course, noticeable that we showed great restraint, but he talked to us longer than we expected, the soldiers from the other camps wanting first of all to talk to a well-known figure of the labour movement and to use the precious time between reports and discussion. Walter Olbricht and Hermann Materi obviously wanted to find out how senior officers of the Nazi Wehrmacht felt about cooperation with anti-fascists and, in particular, with prisoner-of-war soldiers. There were very different opinions on this matter, and we had not yet proved in practice that we were sincerely ready to contribute to the realisation of the goals of the National Committee for a Free Germany. At that time it seemed impossible to count on the cooperation of the generals, although a small group fully shared my opinion that Field Marshal Paulus should be brought to our side. It should be noted, by the way, that during these conversations the various doubts and misconceptions about Marxism which were widespread in our midst also disappeared. All this led to the fact that by the end of the first day we had already abandoned many of our reservations and objections. Two eventful days passed by. We had made new friends, but few of us realised that the greatness of the task before us would require action of such magnitude and have such important consequences. In me a decision ripened to call for the preparation of an organisational association of German officers who had been taken prisoner. On July 13th, the founding conference adopted the manifesto and the appeal to the German people, and elected Erich Weinert as chairman and Karl Goetz and Heinrich von Einsiedel as vice-chairman of the National Committee for a Free Germany. Preparations for the establishment of the German Officers' Union Already a few days after July 13th, Van Hooven and I came into contact with a group of officers who intended to found the German Officers' Union, the very organisation we had in mind. This group was headed by Lieutenant Colonel Brett. He was chief of the rear of the XI Corps of the 6th Army and formerly a member of the Union Steel Helmet and made no secret of the fact that, 
At that time, he had a special confidence in Guggenberg. In addition to him, to the initiative group belonged Major von Frankenberg und Proschlitz, Lieutenant Colonel B. Lai, Major Leverains and Major Blucher, Captain Damask, Oberlieutenant Trenkman, Oberlieutenant von Kirschhofer, Lieutenant Doctor, Greifenhagen and, and Oberlieutenant Gerlach. The military judge von Nobelsdorf Brenkenhoff was also a member of this group. By this time Van Hooven and I had already discussed the questions we had raised thoroughly with General Melnikov, the chief of the Soviet prisoner of war camps, Colonel Professor Dr. Braginsky. The establishment of communication with the initiative group was our first success now we could plan and move forward together with our colleagues. It was clear to us that the participation of the generals in the German Officers' Union was vital to it. Already during the first conversations, the names of Generals Lapman Doctor, Corfes von Seidlitz and Field Marshal Paulus were mentioned, a suggestion which I constantly supported. Even more essential than involving the generals in our cause, we considered it essential to hold conversations with comrades on the ground at Lunev and in the other camps to which we sent delegations. We knew from our own experience what the situation of the Stalingrad officers was, what process of differentiation was taking place in their environment. We imagined what conclusions they had already come to and what they still had to overcome the barriers created by traditional thinking and the code of honour. At one such rally I tried to help them come to the right decision by telling them about my own difficult journey of learning. I urged them to remember Stalingrad, where tens of thousands of German soldiers were senselessly sacrificed on the Führer's orders, against military and strategic considerations, against common sense. I reminded them of all that we had already known for several years, and had witnessed for ourselves the mass persecution of the Jews, the violation of international law, and the laws of warfare in occupied countries. In the past I too had deliberately turned a blind eye to what was really happening, I too had sworn allegiance to Hitler and had kept my oath until Stalingrad, when I realised that for Hitler there was neither international law nor moral criteria. In order that the whole of Germany does not suffer the same catastrophe as happened in Stalingrad, we must oppose total war with total resistance. We in the prisoner of war camps must also participate in this however extraordinary and unparalleled in history. But is it not historically unprecedented the ruinous degeneration that has befallen our homeland through the fault of fascism, the catastrophe that threatens our fatherland? Is this not also the justification for unusual actions? There is no other way than that indicated in the manifesto of the National Committee we must overthrow Hitler, because no one will make peace with him, no one will negotiate with him. Who but us is able to appeal to the high command of the Wehrmacht with the demand to eliminate Hitler and his accomplices? When I finished speaking, there was complete silence. At first, no one wanted to speak. Some clearly sympathised with what I said. My words expressed what they thought. Others simply ignored the common sense considerations and, above all, rejected the conclusions from them they were annoyed and indignant. The thought of a complete break with Hitler and on top of that the prospect of cooperation with the enemy. The suggestion that the High Command should be called upon to refuse obedience, all these were thoughts that put many off. In holding such conversations we had to be patient and remember that we ourselves had come to these conclusions not without internal struggle. The arrival of the generals. One afternoon the Commandant, Colonel Shostin, and with him Major Wolf Stern, a former teacher of German at Moscow University, came to see us. They reported three generals had just arrived, perhaps we know them. They are General von Seidlitz, General Doctor, Corfes and General Latman. Would we not like to establish contact with them, to inform them of the situation in Lunev? Of course we agreed, so the generals were placed in the rooms next to ours. About an hour later our meeting took place in the room of General von Seidlitz. There were only a few minutes of formalities. Seidlitz knew Van Hoven from his sharp confrontations with Schmidt at Paulus's headquarters. I had met Latman when he was in Stalingrad, then still a colonel to form battalions. 
Thus we were all somewhat familiar with each other. The atmosphere in the room at once became very tense. It was clear from the rapid exchange of remarks to the generals that we were getting something from them. But what? No one sat down. There were only two chairs in the room, and sitting down on the edge of the bed was uncomfortable in the conditions of an official meeting. At last we were asked the burning question Seidlitz asked. Tell me, please, what is going on here? The trip here was completely unexpected for us. We were told only that we would meet other officers, many senior officers. Now it was our turn to speak. Van Hooven spoke first, then me. For the first time we both noticed that there was complete unanimity between us, so we were able to support each other in conversation. Hooven covered the problem from the point of view of reason. He resorted to a subtle logical analysis, as if acting with a scalpel. I referred to our common experiences and lessons learned. The people who participated in this meeting had lived through two wars, fought on the same battlefields, sworn an oath that had lost its meaning more than once. We need to look at the oath in a completely new way, I said, carefully clarifying the position of the interlocutors. But I had gone too far, I wanted too much. Seidlitz almost burst into tears. Latman, obviously greatly agitated, turned away to the window without looking at us. Corfees conciliatingly remarked that we should let us speak first. He had nothing against the communists, but they had a completely different idea of the motherland and fatherland than we do, so they did not understand the meaning of the oath. Seidlitz said that the oath of allegiance was sworn to the army, not to Hitler, who himself broke it, shamefully betrayed the army in Stalingrad. Thus he agrees with the condemnation of Hitler's personality, but in no case should not be allowed to form opposition within the Wehrmacht. General Corfees was of quite a different opinion, much of what his colleagues have stated here, he himself understood or assumed, and even once expressed it. This was an allusion to the fact that he had in one serious situation directly refused to follow orders, and this had led to a clash between him and the SS impatiently waving his hand, he muttered. Clear enough examples from history, I mean Yorkaid Nysenau. Yes, but the conditions then have nothing to do with the position we are in here, Latman objected, turning quickly to us and raising two fingers, as if he were an instructor emphasising the meaning of his words. His expressive face was blazing, but he looked extremely trim and correct, unlike Corfi's, who held himself a little carelessly, as if he were a scholar who clearly enjoyed refuting every new argument. For several minutes we stood face to face in silence. Obviously we were not familiar enough to have the kind of conversation that would not normally be possible in the officer corps at all. It was an unprecedented case too, even senior officers engaged in a dispute with generals. Wanting to dispel the awkwardness, we talked about other things that we would meet for dinner, that our rooms were located in the neighbourhood, and that it would be possible to bask in the sun on the balcony in short, we tried to inform the generals about local conditions. The farewell after the first meeting was brief and formal. Shaking hands, we looked at each other questioningly, but no one could look into the other's soul. We saluted in the proper manner. We bowed lightly, as is customary in officers' clubs the last time I had to bow to the generals, was on May 1st in Sazdal, after I had shown our exhibition to the field marshal and the generals who accompanied him. That same evening we sat together in the dining room in the corner, was the table where the generals sat, not far from them, the two of us, at our table the divisional engineers Goetz and Steslin, with whom we had already become acquainted and intimate in the days of the National Committee. As Lantwise sat doctor, Hedemann and Heinrich Hohmann, the military judges, majors, Nobelsdorf, Brenkenhoff, Kurt Schumann and Doctor, Klein, the army pastors, Joseph Kaiser and Johann Schroeder, and at the other tables sat the soldiers. Loud conversation could be heard in the general's rooms until late at night. And we did not fall asleep until after midnight. The thoughts inspired by the conversation with the generals did not give us rest. We thought about the fact that many tens of thousands of Germans who found themselves at Stalingrad 
would have been saved if it had been possible to counter Hitler's criminal demands of a united front, including everyone from Colonel General Paulus to the ordinary infantryman. How now to crush the barbaric regime? Only by relying on the military potential of the anti-Hitler coalition. Then the fighting will end amidst the ruins of the last German village, the last German city. Consequently, it is necessary now here to create a united anti-fascist front from the communist. Worker to the bourgeois intellectual, from the ordinary infantryman to the general. This can only be achieved if we intelligently, taking into account all the consequences and patiently influencing the most diverse people with whom we were dealing after all, we ourselves have only recently come to grips with the meaning of events. We have only just begun to assimilate a completely new outlook on life, a new world view. Conversations with German communists. At some. How would the generals, the old military men, who in most cases had grown up in German officer families with their inherent traditions, feel about exchanging views with the young communists who were also in Lunua and talking to the soldiers? However, it was easier than we expected and caused no complications. Already on the second day, in the evening, in the evening Sergeant Hans Zippel sat at the table of von Siedlitz and Corfis, and then they were joined by Sergeant Achilles from Altenburg, Oberflutten Doctor, Gunther Kircher from Leipzig, and Soldier Heinz Kessler, who made no secret of his communist convictions. They all managed perfectly well to strike up a conversation with the generals, as if it was a matter of course. A few days later a fourth general arrived, my former divisional commander, Alexander Edler von Daniels. It seemed that for the time that we have not seen him, he did not change at all impulsive, unstable, quick to respond to new ideas, he agreeing with something in a burst of passion, not always thought through to the end, what will come out of it. He always treated me and Van Hooven with great confidence we explained ourselves to him, as frankly as we had once done in front of the city prison in Stalingrad, when the general said very aptly it's time to pack up. In Lunev, he may also have favoured Gunther, because Gunther is a brilliant card player and was ready at any time, day or night, to complete the conversation with a few games of cards. In their behaviour adherence to tradition, in the mindset of our generals was a kind of skolokolok Prussian German officer call. The arrogance and prejudice typical of our class were reflected in the way they spoke one more. The other less definite their position was influenced by many things class arrogance, nationalistic arrogance, racial prejudice, as well as a certain one-sidedness and narrow-mindedness in assessing everything that did not pertain to military affairs. In short, these were the same problems, the same prejudices and the same formal thinking that we ourselves had to overcome successively and had not yet finally overcome. We were both amazed and fascinated by everything that was happening in Lunu, the ideological discussions and the cooperation in practice between Marxists and representatives of the German bourgeoisie, army and nobility. We were puzzled because it was contrary to our experience. But we were excited by this process involved in it because without a general unification, without a humanist united front, it was impossible to cope with the disasters that befell Germany. At this time I first came into close contact with Hermann Matern, Edwin Gernel and Anton Ackermann. Whether it was about the ideology of the German bourgeoisie, the Christian and Marxist trade union movement, or land reform, the discussion was imbued with a spirit of cooperation and mutual respect. My interlocutors convincingly formulated the conclusions that emerged from the experience of the struggle of the German labour movement. We learned from each other, we learned to cooperate with each other. Naturally, during the discussions in Lunev and in other officers' camps, there were many officers who did not immediately agree that such cooperation was possible and even necessary, or who did not want to talk about it at all. From the discussions in Krasnogorsk and Suzdal, and even from the discussions in Stalingrad, we were already familiar with this kind of interlocutor, in relations with whom we could only recommend extreme restraint in any case, it was better that such an officer should not guess our intentions. We also noticed that some officers were experiencing a deep mental conflict, which we too had experienced at one time. 
We knew that at certain stages of an ideological crisis one should not make insistent demands on a person, it is better to give him time to think. Sometimes one was struck by the sensitivity of the Marxists when it was necessary to take into account the peculiar features of the representatives of various estates and strata of the population. This was also revealed in conversations with those prisoners of war who could not or could not be convinced that the phrase Hitler's come and go, but the German people and the German state remain. Must be taken literally, and that this very formula offered the German people a real way out of their desperate situation. One thing was undeniable the Marxists with whom we cooperated treated us with complete confidence, although they had to reckon with the fact that incorrigible Hitlerites -y and traitors could penetrate our midst. It was impossible to look into the soul of another person, and only later did it become clear who sought to use the National Committee for selfish purposes, or even for conspiratorial schemes. This was discovered, for example, when Lieutenant General Rodenberg and SS Oberstürmbannführer Huber tried to persuade the frontline commissioners of the National Committee to make contact with the Nazi counterintelligence agencies and the Gestapo. But the behaviour of such people as Einsiedel, Putkamer, Gerlach and others, who, after returning home, did not hesitate to resort to any lie in order to slander the National Committee Free Germany and the Union of German Officers, was also duplicitous. For me personally, it was of decisive vital importance that cooperation between Marxists and non-Marxists was possible, that mutual trust and understanding between them was fostered, and that this commonality served for the good of the people as a whole. It became the basis of my later life, which I sometimes half-jokingly called my second life. It made real what is the meaning of human existence, peace and true humanity. Seidlitz joins us. And Exaldi? In Lunev we became close and each of us general and officer, officer and soldier, communist and Christian learned to listen to the opinion of the interlocutor. But this did not exclude the fact that there were sharp clashes between us. Disputes erupted when one of us emphasised that the military profession, officer service in the Wehrmacht, was inextricably linked to fascist ideology. When we discussed the consequences of Reichenau's order, the order to exterminate commissars, the Scorched Earth Order of December 21st, 1941. Already in Lunev, it could be seen that some people joined us with the hidden expectation that the Soviets and the communists might make concessions if, thanks to the activities of German officers in this national committee, the war could be brought to a quicker conclusion. Such views had to be firmly countered. This had a positive side for us. We were again and again convinced of the necessity of proceeding from the manifesto of the National Committee. The manifesto was not a document that could be manipulated according to one's own understanding or position, or used in practice as one saw fit. The manifesto soberly and realistically proceeded from the actual situation. It took into account the lessons of German history and the experience that Europe had already had a second time in the face of Prussian-German militarism and its patrons. It was necessary to destroy the roots of the inhuman Nazi system. Only then could our fatherland find salvation and the possibility of a new development. This had to be made clear to those who tried to misinterpret our intentions all this was said to them. However, for other reasons too, relations were sometimes strained. I shall never forget the day when, quite involuntarily, in the course of a conversation in the dining room, I expressed my opinion on how the work of the German Officers' Union should be organised and highlighted the issues involved. It was not at all my intention to set forth a definite concept, but when I formulated the idea that we must go beyond theoretical considerations and confessions, I immediately came to natural conclusions, which I impulsively presented to those present. We must reckon with the fact that it will not be possible to persuade the military commanders to refuse obedience to Hitler. What to do then? Then we must see to it that parts of the German army cease resistance. Means and ways can be found. You can also at the front to influence the mechanism of command of the army, using legal and illegal methods and even bypass manoeuvres. Hitler has declared total war. We must respond with total resistance. Why don't we do as Walter Ulbricht, Eric Weinert, Captain Doctor? Hedeman did at Stalingrad. Go to the Soviet front, 
and appeal through the trench lines to oppose Hitler. While I was stating my thoughts aloud in this form, more in an effort to clarify the situation for myself than to outline to others an important programme of action, a great commotion arose in the dining room hall, especially among the generals and some officers of the general staff. There were rejoinders from the seats, stomping of feet as a sign of their apparent disagreement. Others, obviously a minority, applauded the majority was silent, but by no means showing signs of agreement. Then Zeidlitz rose from his seat and, on behalf of the generals, condemned all propaganda of this kind. Activities for the decomposition of the army and this form of cooperation with the communists were out of the question, he said. Thus, by Zeidlitz's birthday, when he turned 55, the situation was still unclear. We placed handmade small gifts on his table and set out flowers. It was noticeable that he, like all of us, was languishing with homesickness. He spoke proudly of his native places, drew an imaginary picture of what his relatives were doing there now, remembering them fondly. Doctor. Corfes, as always, spoke of his four daughters, I of my four boys and Giltrude. It was striking how deeply attached each of us was to our home, how deeply concerned each of us was at the thought of whether our families knew we were alive. After lunch, General Melnikov invited the generals, Van Hooven and me, for a cup of tea. Major Gargadze, Wolf Stern and Colonel Braginsky were present. Of course, the conversation soon touched upon the tasks before us in establishing the officers' union and our further goals. I knew that the generals had had many long conversations with Soviet officers. As well as with General Melnikov, I was also aware that the last conversation with Melnikov had made a great impression on the generals. The birthday, I thought, could be a turning point. When the first toast was made and a shot of vodka was drunk to Zeidlitz's health, I, not thinking long, jumped up from my seat and told Zeidlitz that I knew how close to his heart he took the future of our German people, and therefore I dared to ask him to mark this day of his life by officially taking our side, joining us. In a united impulse, everyone stood up. Seidlitz was clearly agitated. Clearly and firmly he declared his desire to cooperate on the basis of full mutual trust the other generals supported him. In the general's camp, Voikovo. Early in September, we went to Voikovo to talk with Field Marshal Paulus and the other generals. Seidlitz led our group, which included General Latman, Major von Frankenberg and myself. In addition, General Melnikov and some of his officers went there, including Colonel Novikov and Wolfstern. Toward evening we arrived at Voikovo, where a camp was located in a park, intended mainly for generals. When we entered the building in which Paulus and the other generals lived, Seidlitz with his usual vivacity quickly ran up the stairs, we after him and heard him banging hard on the doors, shouting Torigen, Torigen. The doors opened, and the generals, evidently already about to lie down, came out astonished at this unexpected intrusion. After a short explanation, it was at once decided to assemble in the club. Seidlitz spoke first, characterising the situation in general terms with his characteristic passion. Latman clarified his points, speaking in substance, concisely and with great composure. I then received the floor. At first, the generals listened in silence, as if caught off guard by a sudden attack, then it became apparent that they are listening with alert attention, and finally a violent scene played out it became clear to them that we require them to unconditionally renounce Hitler. Word by word it came to the point that I was called a traitor. Colonel General Gates, in a rage, wanted to slap me. As a result of this disgusting scene, some of the generals left the club, while others, obviously agitated, stood up and went to the windows. Frankenberg, the youngest of us, who was standing near me, evidently still had the reverence for generals that had been instilled in him by his training at officers' school, and was therefore stunned by what was happening. It seemed incomprehensible to him that generals could talk and shout like that. During this altercation, Paulus, as I observed it, and in other circumstances, remained calm, dignity and self-control. Seeking to calm the disputants, 
he exclaimed, addressing them attention, gentlemen. I know them, they are people who will never act from unworthy motives. Please listen to them calmly. There was silence in the hall for a while, but everyone felt that the situation had not been diffused. Then the argument broke out again. Frankenberg tried to report on the situation in the Wehrmacht aviation, but it was pointless to continue the conversation. Hastily agreed that another meeting was scheduled for the next morning. We parted and went to our rooms. Even now I remember well how shocked Frankenberg, sitting on the edge of the bed, asked how is it possible? In the midst of generals? Unfathomable. I remembered then my impressions in Sazdol and Krasnogorsk, the conversations in Lunev, which led to the fact that for the first time some generals joined the initiative committee. The path we had chosen was far from easy, it required a break with many of the notions that were considered inviolable in the officer corps. It was the right path, but it was not an easy one to follow, and it was even more difficult to move forward quickly. Besides, I told Frankenberg, we had not been able to explain ourselves, in fact, also for the reason that one of the generals, Geats, lacked self-discipline. The other morning we had an opportunity to talk to some of the generals, some were taking their morning walk, others were working in the vegetable garden. I first sought out Colonel General Strecker, my former corps commander, with whom I had particularly close relations. This time, however, he was withdrawn, evasive and taciturn. He firmly rejected my arguments, though it was evident that he was much agitated. I then spoke to Major General of the Medical Service Rinaldi, whom I had known since 1934, when he had served in the Bavarian Land Police. My brother had served with him with the rank of captain in the medical service. But in this case, too, the matter was limited to a mutual recognition of the honesty of the interlocutor's intentions he respects the officer, respects his views, but unfortunately cannot agree with him at the moment. Conversations with Generals Dubois, Liza, and Roski were of the same character. Nevertheless, they all appeared at the agreed meeting place in the park, where there were benches at the end of the alley. Paulus opened the meeting, endeavouring, as he had the night before, loyally to reach a compromise. Each of us sidelits, Latman, Frankenberg, and myself spoke strictly on the merits and deliberately impassive I tried again to state our arguments and to explain our motives. But the generals remained coldly silent, or, at the very least, made brief objections through their teeth. This showed the influence of the caste spirit, which was already familiar to me from the Susdal period the apostate is alienated. An expression of this caste spirit was also the statement which was handed over to the Soviet commandant of the camp the generals protested against the stay of Siedlitz's group in the camp and against recruitment to the Union of German Officers or to the National Committee. In addition, they all made a commitment not to talk to us again. Were we and our mission a complete failure? We did not consider it so. The front had been broken, what we had said and what we were going to do in the future would all bear fruit. The subsequent course of events confirmed our correctness. Field Marshal Paulus succeeded in cancelling the collective verdict that condemned us, and a year later, our newspaper Phrase Deutschland published Paulus's proclamation this happened on the same day that his old friend Witzelben was hanged by Hitler's executioners. Many of those we talked to in Voikov later signed the 50 General's proclamation to the German Wehrmacht in December 1944. The founding conference of the German Officers' Union. Finally, the decisive day came. On September 11th and 12, 1943, the Union of German Officers was founded in Luniv, the seat of the National Committee, with the participation of 94 officers from camps in Krasnogorsk, Sazdal Orenki, and Elabuga. All prominent figures of the National Committee for a Free Germany, including Wilhelm Pick, Walter Ulbricht, Erich Weinert, and Hermann Mathers, also attended the meeting. During the preparatory talks, General Latman announced that he intended to speak at the meeting on the question of the military oath, and this aroused the enthusiastic approval of the other members of the initiative committee, General Latman, 
who never concealed that he had once considered himself a believing National Socialist, was able to argue persuasively and explained his own evolution so clearly to his listeners that not only did it become clear to them, but they were inclined to follow his example. The first speaker was Gunther van Hooven. His task was to analyse in detail the situation at the fronts, the defeats in the East, in North Africa, in Italy and at sea, but it was also necessary to describe the complete defencelessness of the homeland and the human losses during the night bombardments. The conclusion he formulated stated total war has become total hopelessness. Reason and humanity therefore urge an end to war and peace before it is too late. Hooven also pointed out that the interests of the German and Russian peoples coincided in many respects, and this could serve as a guarantee for a peace that would secure the vital rights of the nation and exclude the possibility of new wars, he further said. In spite of the bitter experience it has received, the Russian people even now still remember what good effects peaceful cooperation has had for several centuries. Of course, the continuation of war increases the hatred of peoples and their desire to destroy the enemy. Therefore, the earliest possible conclusion of peace and friendship with the USSR and with other nations is a vital necessity for Germany. Hooven ended his speech with the following words, Stalingrad was a formidable omen of the catastrophe threatening our people. The Sixth Army, the Stalemi, the Stalingrad Army, was doomed to die, it was declared dead. Now the dead are rising, calling to come to their senses and save the fatherland at the last hour. You have the right to demand this more than anyone else. Long live a free, independent and peaceful Germany. At the request of my comrades, I undertook the task of exposing the slogan of total war as a provocation contrary to the moral foundations of human society. I argued mainly that Hitler's demand for total war was an expression of the immorality of the fascist system. I concluded my speech with the appeal for honour and freedom, for cooperation in the peaceful competition of nations, pointing out that all this can only become a reality if at the same time with Hitler the regime based on boundless lawlessness and unheard of ruthlessness towards man is destroyed. General Latman spoke after me. None of us had ever seen him like this before. I listened to his report with thrilling interest. This usually so reserved and judicious man suddenly gave vent to his feelings he stood before us as if in control of himself, but nevertheless it seemed that every nerve in him was quivering. He repeated to us the refusal of his oath of allegiance that he had experienced in his soul, as if he wanted to hear us approve of his decision in an open and unvarnished manner. Was he right when, alone with himself, he decided to take this step and thus settle accounts with fascism? That was the question that resounded through the electrified audience. Dot, 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 we have sworn allegiance to Hitler personally, there is no ambiguity here. And we swore an oath before God as a solemn vow. That is why the question is so serious, very serious whether we have the right to break this oath, whether we have reasons that can serve to justify such a step, justification before our conscience, before God, and this seems to me, however, less essential before the world. In Stalingrad, a truly loyal generals and officers clearly and honestly told their soldiers the truth about the situation. These generals and officers demanded of themselves and their soldiers to fulfil the military oath at the cost of the most extreme trials. In an environment where death has truly lost its sting, if you compare it with the horrors of bodily and mental anguish. How mature the understanding of the necessity of ending war is, is evident from the fact that it is people like us who can be prevented from acting in favour of peace only by referring again to the power of the military oath. If one were to take such a notion of loyalty to the oath to its ultimate conclusion, one would have to say let Germany perish, so long as it does not violate the oath. The possibility of such an ultimate conclusion would entitle us to believe that it is now immoral to keep the oath. And since we believe that any further struggle leads to the death of our German people, we declare null and void the oath of allegiance to Hitler personally, which was taken under quite different conditions. Since he knew that our oath would shackle us to him, he could make plans by which he was to become the greatest of Germans. 
the precious blood of our comrades was spilled for the sake of this idea, and not at all for the sake of Germany. Did he not abuse our loyalty? Did he not mockingly invoke the rights which he dared to arrogate to himself by using our moral interpretation of the formula of the oath? General Lutman paused briefly between distinctly worded sentences. I glanced back and forth at my comrades in the audience, then glanced again at the general. As I listened, I almost unconsciously watched the play of sunlight on the white tablecloth. The same sun shone on us near Dmitrievka, Novo Alexeevka and Tolovaya Bulka, but we did not notice it, even if it gave us warmth at times. The hand of the sundial moves relentlessly on the surface of the table in front of me two millimetre by millimetre. The movement of time, seconds, minutes, hours is also inevitable. And now we are moving through a certain period of time what was, what is, what will be, what will the new time bring us? Everything lives and acts in time the oaths that bound people to the criminal, the people who lost their time, who did not understand its meaning the comprehension of meaning, born in a split second, but capable of becoming a turning point in time. Higher and higher the sun rises. The line between light and shadow crosses the shoulder of the listening comrade. He keeps his eyes on the general. We did not take an oath at all for him or us to become masters of Europe. We swore by God to remain loyal if we had to fight for Germany. But he, to whom we swore allegiance, has turned the oath into a lie that is why we owe so much to our people. From this duty we derive our right, moreover, we are conscious that it determines the necessity of action. I noticed that General Seidlitz was now worried, too. And for him the hour had come when it was necessary to make a decision openly to sum up many days of heated debate, reflection and hesitation, to overcome courageously the underlying desire to avoid a step which would have the most serious consequences in his life down to the relations in the close circle of his family. He, a representative of an old noble family, was faced with the immediate necessity of taking the side of the communists, proletarians, revolutionaries. After all, during this time it became clear to him, as well as to other generals, that it is impossible to achieve the set goals and even more impossible to achieve them by choosing a special Prussian-German way. He passionately, in simple words, gradually raising his voice, supported our ideas and emphasised that the source of our actions is the consciousness of our duty to the people and the fatherland. Therefore nothing in our actions contradicts the sense of honour of decent people. In conclusion, at the founding conference of the German Officers' Union, General Seedlitz was elected Chairman of the Union, General Edler von Daniels, Colonel van Hooven, and myself as Vice-Chairman, Major Hermann Leverenz as Secretary of the German Officers' Union. Major General's Doctor, Corfes and Latman and all members of the initiative group were elected to the Presidium. The officers and generals present unanimously approved the declaration, which stated, The war has become senseless and hopeless. To continue means to act only in the interests of Hitler and his regime. Therefore, the National Socialist Government, whose actions are directed against the well-being of the people and the country, will never allow the country to take the path leading to peace. This conviction compels us to declare war on Hitler's pernicious regime and to advocate the establishment of a government that has the confidence of the people and the fullness of power to secure peace and a happy future for our fatherland. In addition, the surviving officers of the Sixth Army issued a special proclamation to German generals and officers, the people and the Wehrmacht. All Germany knows what Stalingrad is. We have experienced all the torments of hell. In Germany we were buried alive, but we have risen to a new life. We can no longer remain silent. Like no one else, we have the right to speak not only on our own behalf, but also on behalf of our fallen comrades, on behalf of all the victims of Stalingrad. This is our right and our duty. We further urged fervently in our appeal. It is now necessary to save the whole of Germany from a similar fate. The war continues solely in the interests of Hitler and his regime, contrary to the interests of the people and the fatherland. 
the continuation of a senseless and hopeless war may one day lead to a national catastrophe. To prevent this catastrophe already now is the moral and patriotic duty of every German who realises the full measure of his responsibility. We, the generals and officers of the Sixth Army, are determined to give a deep historical meaning to the hitherto senseless deaths of our comrades. Their deaths must not remain in vain. The bitter lesson of Stalingrad must be transformed into salvific action. That is why we are addressing the people and the army. We say first of all, to the military leaders generals, officers of our armed forces. It depends on you to make a great decision. Germany expects you to find the courage to face the truth and to act boldly and immediately accordingly. Do what must be done, otherwise it will be accomplished without you or perhaps even against you. The National Socialist regime can never take the path that alone can lead to peace. Recognising this fact commands you to declare war on this pernicious regime and to advocate the formation of a government that would be based on the confidence of the people. Only such a government can create the conditions for an honourable exit of our fatherland from the war and ensure a peace which will not be a misfortune for Germany and will not carry within itself the germ of new wars. Do not abdicate your historical vocation. Take the initiative in your own hands. The army and the people will support you. Demand the immediate resignation of Hitler and his government. Fight shoulder to shoulder with the people to eliminate Hitler and his regime and save Germany from chaos and disaster. With universal approval, it was also decided to document for public knowledge the fact of close cooperation with the National Committee. Some generals and officers were co-opted into the National Committee, Seidlitz and Daniels and the soldier Maxim Endorfer were elected vice-chairman of the National Committee.